Take your Bibles, Revelation chapter 20, and if you'll put up on the scriptures, let's get the sort of scriptures there today. Revelation chapter 20 this morning, I want to preach on a subject, uh, an issue the Lord dealt with me about, and uh, I want to preach this morning on five minutes and 13 seconds in hell. Five minutes and 13 seconds in hell, and I'll tell you later in the message why I titled this message what I did. Uh... As he puts these scriptures up on the wall, we're going to look at several scriptures. I wouldn't even try to just write them down if you're interested in looking at them later. But uh, I love practical life value of the Bible. Amen. I like uh, the Bible has practical value life. Coming to church, you ought to be able to hear preaching on money and finances. You ought to be able to preach on marriage and children and all the work and business and all these things. You ought to hear preaching on that. But I'm going to say this to you. A preacher that and a church that neglects to warn people of the wrath of God Hell is guilty of the high, in the highest degree of a lack of love for souls. A church ought not just to be practical. And by the way, this is the trap that many churches have fallen into. Is all they want to preach on stuff that they think people will appreciate in their life that they're living out here in the world. And they're not looking on into eternity. And that's a dangerous, dangerous mistake for an individual or church to make. And, but we must not hide our minds and our hearts. I don't like to think about hell. I don't like it. I don't like to preach on hell. Don't like to think about it. But it is a biblical reality, and I'm going to show you from Scripture that it is. Now, I do not continuously dwell on it. I'm going to go out this afternoon. I'm going to look at the green grass. I'm going to look at the buds on the trees, watch the geese fly over, watch an eagle or two, and wait for the dogwoods and the red buds. But I'm not going to let escape from my mind the reality that there are people dying and going to hell without Jesus Christ. And we need to get it now. Uh, we're going to take off this morning. It says there in chapter 20 and verse number 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let me say first of all this morning that hell and the lake of fire are not the same. Hell is in the heart of this earth. It's in the heart of this earth. And I'm not going to take you to all the scriptures right now to prove that, but I can prove that to you in the Bible. And hell is where people go who die lost without Jesus Christ now. Amen. Immediately when they die, they're in hell. That fast. Yeah. The Bible said the rich man died, was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. Yeah. The lake of fire is somewhere out in the universe we do not know. Scientists claim there's a black hole out there somewhere. I don't know, but I can tell you this. The Bible said in Revelation 20 there that death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were standing before this great white throne, which they were being judged according to their works. And there's only one group of people here, and that's lost people. Death and hell delivered up the dead to them. And they're judged according to their works. And there's only one place that they go to as a result of this judgment. And that is to the lake of fire. Where the lake of fire is, I don't know, but God will take care of that. But it is a reality. So you have hell, it's like a, a local prison. And uh, uh, the lake of fire is like after you've been judged, before the judge, it's like the uh, penitentiary. And it's forever. Now, we're going to look at a lot of scriptures today, and you just keep a trucking. This is the first mention of hell in the Bible. For the fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with their increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I want you to go to Second Samuel chapter 22. The so uh, David speaking, the sorrow of hell can pass me about, and the so snares of death prevent me. I want you to look at that three words, the sorrows of hell. The sorrows of hell. David did not downplay the reality or the condition of hell. In Job Job chapter 26 and verse number 6, the Bible said, Hell is naked before him, talking about God. It said, In destruction hath no covering. In Psalms chapter 9 and verse number 17, the Bible said, The wicked shall be turned into hell. Now, what am I doing this for? You, if, if you went to a lot of churches and listened to a lot of preachers, you would think that the Bible had nothing to say about hell. If you preach on hell, you're mocked as an old time hell fire and brimstone preacher. As if that's some kind of stupidity. Let me just tell you something. The man that won't warn you of hell doesn't love you. He's trying to get in your pocket. Let me tell you, if you're visiting here today or, you, or you've been here a while, I'm not after your money. Do you understand me? I, I don't care if you never put a dime in that box back there. Nobody here is after your money. We care about your soul. We don't want you to die and go to hell. We want you to be saved and we love enough to be honest. There's no games. There's no gimmicks. There's no angle here. Yeah. Amen. 
Jesus Christ died for my sin, died for your sin. That's the only way you can be saved, through his shed blood. Faith in Jesus Christ. Psalms 18, verse number 5. Again, David said, look at that phrase, the sorrows of hell. What are the sorrows of hell? In Psalms 55, and verse number 15, the Bible said, let death seize upon them. Let them go down quick into hell for the wickedness is in the dwellings and among them. In Psalm, Proverbs chapter 5, and verse her statement here talking about the immoral woman. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. God is telling men here that if you go after immoral women, you're going to bust hell wide open. That's what he's telling you. In Proverbs chapter 7, verse 27, her house is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. Now, let me throw something at you. Some people, if preachers or churches, they'll act like hell's mentioned a little bit in the New Testament. Do you know what? We've been all this time so far in the Old Testament. The Old Testament's got a, maybe, in fact, it has greater revelation about the condition of hell than some of what the New Testament has. In Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 18, but who, he knoweth not that the dead are there, and the her guest. The men who follow her is in the depths of hell. God says you go after immorality, after whoredom, after fornication, after adultery. You're going to bust hell wide open. The Bible said fornicators and all that list shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Most people don't believe that. 15 and verse number 11, hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more the hearts of the children of men. God knows our hearts. In Proverbs chapter 27 and verse number 20, hell and destruction are never full. Never full. Jesus said, straight as the gate, and there is a way, and few there be that find it. And he said this, he said, about the way of destruction. He said, many there are which go in thereat. God teaches Jesus Christ. Do we believe in him? He believe he's telling us. He said there's more people going to go to hell than they are going to be saved. Yeah. Yeah. Deuteronomy, uh, let's go to Isaiah. I want you to watch these verses. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Why are the sinners in Zion afraid? What has happened to the, the hypocrites that they're, they're surprised? Fearfulness has surprised them. Then he asked this question. I want you to ask this question. Who among us shall dwell with the, everla- with the divine fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Almost every Sunday I get up and preach. I wonder who here is going to wind up in hell in spite of the fact that they came to church, in spite of the fact that they've heard the preaching of the Word of God. They're still going to wind up and go to hell. The Bible said, who among us? I wonder who among your family. I wonder who among your children. I wonder who among this church is going to bust hell wide open. As we look at Isaiah chapter 28 and verse number 15, because you've said, we've made a covenant with death and with hell we are agreement. Did you you know, there's people all over the United States like that. I say, I'm going to drink beer with my buddies. I'm going to go to hell, drink beer, and play cards with my buddies. I'm, I'll tell you, and, and they act like hell, some kind of a party hole. They've made a covenant with hell. And he said, your agreement with hell shall not stand. Look at verse number uh, 18. Uh, I'm sorry, chapter 20. Uh, Isaiah 5, 14. Watch this verse. This amazing verse. This is Bible. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall descend into it. God says that hell is enlarging its mouth to hold the multitudes of people that are going into it. In Isaiah, or Matthew chapter, Isaiah 14, watch this verse. This is Old Testament doctrine on hell which Jesus took and preached on. Hell from beneath thee, where's beneath you, it's in the heart of this earth, is moved, it's rotating. You know that this earth is at 30,000 degree molten lava in the center of this earth, moves to the outside to about 9,000 degree molten. I mean, every once in a while, such pressure in there, it pops out through volcanic activity. God knows what he's talking about. Hell from beneath is moved to thee to meet thee at thy coming. People do really go to hell. I don't care what pet people said at your funeral. They still, people go to hell. If you've never been born of the Spirit of God, you're going to bust hell wide open, and you need somebody to love you. I'm not mad at you. I don't hate you. I love you. You think I enjoy preaching this? You've lost your ever-living mind. I'm telling you, if I'm a, what kind of preacher would not warn people about hell? I'll tell you what, some pimp, that's what he is. He's after your money. He's after your praise. He's after you. I want to tell you something. And by the way, you mock me, smirk me. I don't care what you do. You don't scare me in the bit. Preachers are afraid to preach on hell. They're afraid people leave church over it. Yeah. 
Take your Bible. Go ahead. Yet, Isaiah 14 and verse number 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Can I tell you something further? The Bible is very clear that many people who think they're going to heaven are not. They've never been born again in the Spirit of God. I want to ask you a question this morning. When were, when were you saved? When did you come to God in repentance of sin and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner? Did you know you never read in your Bible? Dear God, dear God, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. Repeat after me, repeat after me, repeat after me that that'll get you to heaven. Did you know your Bible never says if you walk down an aisle and fall down that bench, if that saves you, that will not save you. There's only one thing that will save you, and that's Jesus Christ's blood. Faith, faith from your heart. He that believeth with his heart. That Jesus Christ died, shed his blood, rose from the dead. That's what saves you. It's not some little penny any prayer that you repeated after somebody. Amen. Now you may have meant it, you may have got saved. I'm not saying you did it. But the, that is repeating after somebody, walking forward, getting baptized, does not save you. And Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do many by works in thy name? In thy name cast out devils? And he'll say, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and angels. He said, I never knew you. Never did know you. Serious stuff. I'll show you at the end of this message, any verses, why I'm going to preach what I'm going to preach today. Let's go further. Matthew chapter 5, we're in the New Testament. There's enough verses in the Old Testament. By the way, I didn't give you all of them. We can't get to all of them. We don't have time. Don't tell me hell's not in the Old Testament. Those men believed in hell. They knew, they knew what God said about it. Matthew chapter 5. Watch this. I want you to watch the context here. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now this is Christianity. It lifts a man from what he thinks he does and doesn't do to what he thinks and who he is. Yeah. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And Jesus said, your adulterous heart, your, your adultery has to do with your heart, not your actions. Your actions spring out of your heart. Right. Now you watch this. I want to show you the context. Whosoever looked at the moment lust after her committed adultery with her already in his heart. If thy right eye offend thee, what did he just get through talking about? Whosoever looketh. If thy right eye offend thee, do what, Jesus? What? You don't hear nobody in America or the world that I know about preach about a Jesus who told you to pluck your eye out. Why would Jesus tell you to pluck your eye out? Oh, he really didn't mean that. Well, why'd he say it for then? Why would he want you to pluck your eye out? I'll show you why. Pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I sometimes, when I read the Bible and hear what Jesus preached to people, what John the Baptist preached to people, I feel like I ought to crawl off and say, you know what, I, I'm, I, am, I, am, I am a wimp of a preacher. I don't have the guts and the courage and the love to preach the truth like they did to people. Can you imagine what Jesus is saying here? He's saying that if you have an adulterous heart, you'd be better off take a stick and gouge your eye out and throw that eye away from you than to die and go to hell. It's not funny. I mean, either you believe it or you don't. I mean, just ask yourself this little question. How many times has your TV evangelist preached on this? How many times has your favorite devotionalist mentioned hell? We're living in a generation of, you know when America was good? It's when the Doc Bill said in his assessment of America that what made America great and good was America was good because he said the preachers, the pulpits were aflame with the fire of Almighty God. And people had the fear of God, and that fear of God produced the love of God and the mercy of God in their lives, and they lived right. I'm going to tell you something. This ain't the same nation it was in 1950. You didn't have all this trash and filth and nastiness, nakedness. 
women still dress modestly. Men didn't look like a bunch of queers. I'll tell you, the, uh, I don't even want to go there this morning, but this whole nation is, the whole satanic plan right now is to turn men into effeminate. Transgender crap. Straight out of the bowels of hell. That Hollywood media crowd makes me sick. These transgender perverts and satanic things, they'll get on there and act like that's just wonderful. Man, that's just great. You shouldn't say anything about that. And then they turn around and claim they're for women's rights. Yeah. And they think it's just fine for some idiot to compete in a swimming competition and beat all the girls. And then they claim they're for women. Yeah. You don't ever forget this, that everything the devil does is backward of God Almighty. And his end deal is to pervert what God designed and to send you to hell with it. Amen. Right, amen. That's right. Let's go further. Let's uh, he cast you the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Did you hear what he said? You're cast into outer darkness in that hell. He talks about hell as a place of outer darkness. He said there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where are we at? Mark, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Old preacher said, If you go to hell, you go to hell as an intruder. God never created it for you. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it's better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck as he were cast in the sea. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Better for thee to enter into the life man than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the firm dieth, worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. And I'm going to tell you, don't give me any of your Seventh-day Adventist junk about annihilation that you just go to hell and you're burned up like a matchstick. That's a lie out of hell. Everything the Bible talks about, everlasting fire, everlasting torment. I'm going to tell you, you go to hell, you're going to be an eternal, eternal, Eternal torment. People in hell weeping and gnashing their teeth. Amen. They're not annihilated. Amen. I'm going to be honest with you. It just, it just blows my mind out to think about hell. It's hard for me to comprehend that there are people in hell right now. That people that, that, that die without Christ are going to hell forever. And my flesh wants to say, no, no, it can't be true. It can't be true. It can't be true. But the Bible says either it's true or Jesus Christ is a total imposter joke. That's right. If you don't believe in hell, you're calling Christ a liar. Amen. Luke 16. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Drinking beer. Playing cards. Sitting at the beach, watching TV? No. Torments. And see if Abraham lies, uh, far off lies in the bosom. I, I, I'll get, I could get into that, but, one, but there used to be two compartments to the inner earth. It was paradise and hell. When Jesus died, was buried, he took paradise up. That's why he told the thief on the cross today, we'd be in paradise, not heaven. He, took, he led captivity captive. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. I'm going to throw this at you when I'm talking about getting saved. When's the last time you ever heard anybody in America fall on their face before God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner? Right. Nobody says that. It's kind of like we joined the club. Yeah. We, just joined the, we just joined the deal. And our little church club, it lets us go live like hell. I'll give you that verse again. Ye adulteresses and adulterers, know ye not that friendship with this world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore, whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world. I'm telling you right now, the last thing I ever want to be is a friend to this world. Because the friendship with the world is enmity with God, and whosoever will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. I want to ask you a question. Who are you friends with? Who are you friends with? Who do you really, what do you, who, what is it out here you love that really turns you on, that really gives you a thrill, that rejoices, boy, I mean, you, you just get into it. Some of you going down the road, you listen to your stupid music, and you're doing this, and you go get up here and sing a song about Jesus Christ, and you said you're like, I'm not all along. I know who your friend is. Dolly Parton. He lived hell and lifted up his eyes. Have mercy on me. Sin Lazarus. What's this verse? This is Christ. This is not a parable. A certain man died. Yeah. Have mercy on me. Sin Lazarus. Why? That he may dip the tip of his finger in water 
and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. He said, I'm just not interested in this. I got a life to live next week. Head on. Go get in your car. Help yourself. You don't have to endure this. Ain't no guards there guarding the door. We don't have the door locked. <laughs> You're not interested? Fine. Ain't nobody going to force God ain't going to force you to get saved. You can reject Jesus Christ. You can rebel against God. You already are. You're, you can reject it. Luke 12, but I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that uh, mock you during the week. Be not afraid of them that kill the body and that have that have no more they can do. But I will forewarn you, warn you, whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to put both. He said, fear him. Have power to cast hell. I say unto you, fear him. The other passage of scripture talks about have power to cast both in hell. I want to tell you something right now. God tells you who to fear. You don't fear this world. You don't fear your friends. You don't fear your buddies. You don't fear anybody but God Almighty. Amen. Amen. We go further. Luke 13. Watch what he says. There shall be weeping, gnashing of teeth, when you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the prophets, and the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. John 3.36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. But he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But what? You don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you haven't received him as your Savior, the wrath of God abides on you. John, Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. You know the truth, but don't mean anything. Romans 2, 5. But after the hardness and impenitent heart. What kind of heart you got today, an impenitent? I'm not repenting. I'm not coming to Christ. I don't have to ask God forgiveness for nothing. That's you. You're treasuring up unto yourself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Let me just tell you something about God. If you, the reason people don't know God in America, they don't read their Bibles. If you read your Bible, you would know this, that God's greatest attribute is not his love. God's greatest attribute is his holiness and his justice. Your daughter gets raped, throat slit, thrown in a ditch. They find the guy, take him before the judge. And the judge says to the guy that did it, you know, I just love you. I'm not going to charge you anything. Go on there. Have a good day. And you're sitting over there. Did you know that not a person in this church that would jump up, and literally jump up and run up to the judge's bench and say, you are an unjust judge. What do you mean letting this guy off because you love him? That is not love. And if God lets me go and you go without repenting of sin and trusting Jesus Christ and our sins paid for, uh -uh. The fact that God, he so loved you that he gave his son to die for you so you wouldn't have to go to hell. He is a just God and my sin and your sin has to be paid for in full. And Jesus did that. And that's the good news of the gospel, that Christ sent his son. It's so simple, don't make it complicated. I'm glad God made the gospel for a dumb man. Amen. I'm glad he made it for a hillbilly could understand. Look at the next passage of Scripture. Romans chapter 5, verse number 9. Much more now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Ephesians 5, 6. Much, Ephesians 5, 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. That's why it bothers me when people have a disobedient spirit toward the Bible. I wonder if they're saved or not. Colossians 3, 6. For which sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. First Thessalonians 1.10. And to wait for his son from heaven. That's what we're doing. Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath of, to come. If you're saved here today, you've been delivered from the wrath to come. Someone has said that hell is the eternal storm of God's wrath against sin. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.8 and 9. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the, from the glory of his power. Hebrews 10.29. Watch this very carefully. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. Now, will you listen to me well? You may be on, listening online today. 
You may be in this building. But you're lost without God. You've never been born again. You've rejected Jesus Christ. You're trying to go to heaven on the basics of good works. Or you really don't care at all. And you walk out that door after heard, heard what you've heard about the blood of Jesus, that he died for you. Did you know you're trampling on the blood of Jesus right. Christ? You're saying, I don't need it. It was a waste of time. God wasted his time sending him, and you just will spit on that. Watch what God says. Did you notice here that God didn't say uh, uh, that? He said, uh, how much sore punishment to the drunk, to the drug head? Uh-uh. Shall he be thought with you of trodden underfoot the Son of God, and counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, Christ was sanctified, an unholy thing, and done despite unto the Spirit of grace. You trample on the grace of God, there's nothing left for you. There's nothing left for you. And God says, if you trample on the grace of God, that's sore punishment. Second Peter chapter 2. Watch this. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. See, the whole deal, like in hell, those people in hell today are reserved unto judgment at the great white throne before they go to the lake of fire. Bringing the flood upon the world of God and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. I'm just going to tell you something. It won't shock me if within some of your lifetime, if Jesus doesn't come, that China and Russia will blow America into ashes. It's not going to shock me. And I'm going to tell you why it's not going to shock me. Because we're a full-fledged Sodom and Gomorrah country right now. We're a full-fledged Sodom and Gomorrah country. All across this country right now, teachers' unions have formulated curricula study and little books for children K through 12. And unless a local school absolutely searches and keeps it out, they will have it in teaching your children. That they cannot know whether they're male or female. That they should decide. And that being a sodomite is fine. You listen to me. We're Right now, everywhere, this week there was a forum up uh, in some, uh, Ohio or somewhere up there. And some people with a, a conservative American, you know, traditional kind. Of, really wasn't a Christian deal, but they just believed in Christian values. Went up there to have a debate with some atheists. And this organization had put out a statement of their opposition against transgenderism. 150 to 200 students from the university showed up and shouted them down and were so forceful in their hatred and in their vengeance that they had to call the police to escort these people to safety. That's Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember Genesis 19? That when they were in town, the mob came and they said, we'll do worse to you. Bring them out to us. You don't know what you're getting ready to hit. We're getting ready to where churches, schools, businesses, everybody will bow the knee to the bale of sodomites. Or you won't, be, you won't do business. That's where the Mark of the Beast deal is coming in, by the way. Yeah. They'll force you to bow to Satan's doctrines. You will believe what he says is good and right, not what God says. The next one, 2 Peter 3, 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Jude, verse number 7. As Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. If that's not a case of America, you listen to me right now. And every Sodomite listen to me. I want to tell you why you make me sick. Because you're a pedophile. You're a pedophile. You'll rape these little kids. We, if we didn't protect our kids, if we didn't watch out for our kids, you sodomites would have them in 15 minutes. You know I'm telling you the truth. Every parent in this church house has got to protect your kids. Watch where they're at for fear of some stupid, wicked, nasty, filthy sodomite getting a hold of your children. Just this week, four-year-old girl snatched. If a man hadn't been jumped in his truck and followed that guy and called the cops, they'd have had her. That man had her down in the floorboard of his truck. And they stopped that car, his truck, and told him to get his face on the ground. I ain't hurt nobody. I, I didn't do anything to anybody. I stinking liar. Yeah, amen. Made her get out. They opened that door, and she jumped up and said, I want my daddy. I want my daddy. Yeah. I just picked her up. What do you think he is? He's watching the stupid internet like some of you are doing. You're getting messed up in child pornography. I'm going to tell you there's not a spot in hell that's bad enough for you if you would do something like that to a little child. Yeah. Sex trafficking, Bill Clinton. Yeah. 
Underage girls. Yeah. yeah. This country from the top to the bottom. I'm telling you, Joe Biden is a wicked, I mean wicked. He put, we've got a full-blood sodomite who's got a man living with him who just got through adopting babies running the Department of Transportation in this country. That's right. Sick. 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 Listen, hey, this ain't time to say, oh, we'll have a little marriage conference so you can have a little better marriage. Can I tell you something? You get an old time fear. If God gets saved and understand what hell is, you'll have a better marriage. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That fix you. You don't need some seminar and some conference. You need to get right with Almighty God. You need to have the fear of God. You know what? Say, you know what? There's a hell to be shunned. There's a heaven uh, to, that we're headed to. This thing is real. We're going to live right, do right in our family because of the wrath of God. We don't want our children raised in garbage. Go ahead. Revelation 6. They said the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? You not. And I'm not. If you're not in Christ, you're in trouble. Revelation 19 or Revelation chapter 1 verse number 18. I am, watch this. It's Jesus Christ speaking. I am he that liveth, was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. He said, well, would Jesus send anybody to hell? You better believe it. You reject him, there's no other hope for you. He said, well, you ought not do that. Well, then you tell God how unjust he is. You tell God how unjust he is. You see, your problem is you don't think sin amounts too much. You don't think sin should, God should think too much about your sin. But you don't know God. You're an idolater because you've carved out a God in your mind that's okay with your sin. Did you know what you can do? You can carve out a God in your mind that's okay with you committing adultery. And the devil say, well, David did. And David had all these wives, and Abraham had all these wives. And Solomon had, he was stupid. Somebody says he's the wisest man in the world. I say he's the stupidest man in the world. 600 wives, 300 concubines. What's that about? And he wrote, and he's the one who wrote Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. Yeah. Said the gates is on the way to hell. I'm telling you right now. Revelation 14, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture in the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. If you're annihilated, how can you be tormented? If you just burn up like a matchstick, like these, some of these really, like Jehovah Witnesses tell you, how, how, how can you be tormented? If I cease to exist, I'm annihilated, I can't be tormented, right? That's, right. That's, right. That's how they sucker you in, because they, they don't pay, boy, that'd be a good deal, they ain't no hell. Right. Now you listen to me, I didn't come in on the last load of pumpkins, you can turn me off all you want to, but you ain't going to turn the Holy Ghost off. That's right. Because when that seed's planted in your heart, it'll be there. You're driving down a road six years from now, and you what you'll think about? Hell. You better get saved. Go further in Revelation 20, we, we, at verse number 19, there, 19, verse 15, his mouth shall go forth with this, shall something like the nations, rule them with rod arms, and tread the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Let's go down to Ezekiel, Bellas, if you will, Ezekiel chapter 33. I want to show you something. I want to show you why I'm preaching this. Watch this carefully. Please listen to the God's word. I'm going, to ask you, I'm going to ask you to do something right now. Do not let me get between you and Jesus this morning. You listening? You're looking at my personality. You don't like it or whatever. I can't, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't want that, but I can't help it. You say, I don't like your attitude. I don't like the way you preach. Like, people tell me, say, Reg, you got a rough edge to you. I don't know. I think John the Baptist did too. His, rough, his edge was so rough, they cut his head off. He told the leader of that nation, the ruler of that nation, said, you're an adulterer. You've got your brother's wife. And from that moment on, they was after him. I want you to look at this. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. That's why I'm warning you. I don't want none of you people, even online, saying, Reggie, at judgment, Reggie, you did not warn me. 
God says, when I tell that wicked man, you're going to die. And thou speakest not to warn him. Now, I don't know what it means to have his blood upon me, but it ain't good. I can just tell you that. Look at the next verse, if you will, there. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, uh, verse number 9. When I say in the wicked, the wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn him. But look at verse number 9. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he doth do not turn from his way, he shall die in his wicked, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Now, that's just not for preachers. That's for everybody that knows the Lord. We're not warning people. That's why this church, our evangelistic efforts are to warn people to flee from the wrath to come. To warn them of the judgment of Almighty God and the wrath of God against sin. And then to tell them there's hope in Jesus Christ. There's full forgiveness, free forgiveness, forever forgiveness. And you can be saved. But if we don't warn them, God says, I'm going to hold it to you on judgment day and their blood will be upon you. Verse number 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I want you to know something today. God does not take pleasure in sending anybody to hell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Can you imagine such a thing? God giving his son for you that he loves you that much. He don't take pleasure in you dying and going, God in there, ah, good, I got to throw another one in hell. That's not God at all. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Watch this. But that the wicked turn from his way. Now you listen to me good. I do not, I, I do not, that word turn is the Old Testament terminology for Repentance. You were headed this way in sin, following the world, following the devil, following the flesh. And God said, turn. And I believe in turning. I can remember when God, by his grace, turned me. To be honest with you, you won't turn on your own. It'll be the spirit of God working in you and his grace working in you that causes you to turn. Even your repentance is not of, not of you. But he said... He said, what I want, I don't want you to die in your wickedness. But I want that wicked to turn from his way and live. Turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? And you can apply that to a lost sinner. Why will you die? I want to show you something this morning. I want you to, we're going to put up a, a video. And I want to show you something. This morning. I want everybody quiet. And I want you to, to watch what goes on here. You put that video on up, guys, if you will. Somebody said, Reggie, why did you name this message five minutes and 13 seconds in hell? Number five is the number of grace. Five minutes sometimes in this life seems like it just goes by like that. Next thing you know, it's not just five minutes over three days has passed. But five is the number of grace. And I want you to know something, that if you go to hell, every five minutes you will realize that you could have been saved by grace and that you turned grace away. It didn't cost you. You didn't have to live good enough. You just needed to receive Christ as your Savior. And you turned grace away. Remember despising the spirit of grace. Now, they're going to start this video. On January the 19th, in 2019, this occurred. There was a gas line rupture in a gas line in Mexico. And I want you to watch the video, about a minute and something. If you guys will turn that on. Turn this slide off, please, if you can. What you're seeing right now is someone with a camera. I want you, would you back that up to its start? Back it up to its start. I want, you, I want you to see something for just a second. Back it up to its start, please. Uh, back it up further, please. It needs to go all the way back. This is the picture of the gas line that ruptured. And what people were doing is they were taking their five-gallon buckets, every kind of container they were finding, and they were trying to fill them with this gas that was erupting from the gas line. And they were warned, don't go around this. But they come in there, back it on up, guys, if you please, if you will, and keep it there about where all them people were coming in. And they warned them, they said, don't come around this. Now, just back it up and stop it where the, all the people's at, please, if you don't care. No, right, right here, just stop it right there. People came in there by the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. 
And they only sent 18 policemen down there. And when the policemen came, they couldn't keep the people away. And this went on now. Watch this. This went on all day long. And they kept telling these people, this thing could erupt. This thing could blow up. You need to stay away from here. Uh, it reminds me of how people are about sin. It reminds me about how they are when you warn them about their wrath to come. They just don't think it's going to happen to them. Somehow or another, I'll make it. Well, if so-and-so makes it, I'll make it. And I won't get in trouble playing with this gas, this sin. If you watch very carefully in here, you will see people becoming literally soaked with gasoline. It was spraying. And in order to get the gasoline, they had to get into the spray of the gasoline. Go ahead. It comes nightfall, and they're still getting it. They're holding containers. Now, at this moment, stop it right there. This is the moment after dark came that night that it exploded. Okay? And somebody caught it on a camera. Now, go ahead. I want you to watch something here. Look at the, the flames coming up. Now, I want you to watch very, very carefully right in through here. These are people who are on fire who are running from it. I don't know for sure. Some reports say there was 150 people killed. Some say there were 300 and some killed. We do know that many of them died later on. Now watch this right here. Stop the, stop the film right here. This... This, 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 all this are people on fire. Now I want you to notice one thing they all had in common. They are fleeing. They're running. Every one of them. Ain't nobody stood there and go, oh, I've got to get another gallon of gas. Your Bible says to flee from the wrath to come. But there comes a point in time it's going to be too late to flee. Yeah. And it came that point in time for these people here. Go ahead. Folks, that had to be one of the awfulest, awfulest scenes that ever was on the face of this earth that happened to these people. There is a photo, an, an after photo of this thing where two people are on the ground, burned up, you know, their, their bodies are burned. It's a mother and her son. And she's on the ground, and I don't know if you know how fires will do, but they'll lock your body into position. And that son was, I mean, two feet in front of her, burned up, and she, her hand is reaching out to her boy. And they're both laying just like that. And if there's ever been a picture ever been a picture of what hell will be like. I have a little video clip I put out called The Worst Thing a Father Will Ever Hear. And that's the screams of your own sons and daughters having followed you to hell. That's right. You're tinkering. And I'm going to tell you what. Hell be bad enough but for me to hear my sons and my daughters Weeping, wailing, gnashing their teeth because they followed me there. You talk about adding to my torment. Amen. I'm begging you this morning. You say, Reggie, five minutes and 13 seconds in hell. I'm not going to do it. But if I was to stand here and weep and wail and gnash my teeth for five minutes, you'd think it was an eternity. Will he ever stop? Five, 13 seconds in hell would be like eternity. Every second's like an eternity. I believe every preacher ought to go to hell for five minutes and 13 seconds. He'd come back. He quit his tinkering around. Yeah. I believe every daddy ought to go to hell for five minutes. You wouldn't treat God like he's some used tire. Back seat of your life back there. You might think about having prayer with your sons and daughters. You might think about making sure that you're at church, making sure you're living right, making sure you're doing right. 
If you went five seconds to hell, I think he'd change you. Every mom ought to spend five minutes and 13 seconds in hell. Oh, you listen to me. I'm not trying to hurt, but I can't help going through my mind right now, Brother Lane. The joy of knowing that your boy didn't go to hell. Amen. Hard enough to live with him being gone now. But what if he thought he'd never been saved? He was 16 years old. He had no time for God. He didn't love the Lord. He wasn't never been born again. And every day of your life, I guarantee your mind would think, my boy's in hell. There was a mother who her son was with three or two other boys in a car wreck. And the police called and woke her up at night and said, you need to come down to the station. And the, she, they, they got all over pastor. And they come down there and he's dead. And she ran up to the preacher and she grabbed him by the, is my boy in hell? Is my boy in hell? He's drunk. She didn't want to know if he made the three-pointer. She didn't want to know if he was on the basketball team. She didn't want to know if he killed an eight-point buck. She wanted to know if he was in hell. When are we going to wake up? When are we going to wake up? Every mother ought to spend five minutes and 13 seconds in hell. And I tell you, I don't think you'd be quite so concerned about all the junk that you think is so important to your children's lives right now. Every young person, it do you good to spend five minutes in hell. I believe you come back and say, you know what, I need to be living for eternity. Amen. I need to be living for something that counts. Five minutes in hell, you know what the tragedy is? Every lost person, I guarantee you, every lost person, if you could spend five minutes and 13 seconds in hell, you'd quit saying, well, not today. I don't feel like it today. I think I'll think about it a while. No, uh -uh. five minutes and 13 seconds in hell, you come back ready instantly. You'd say, shut your mouth, preacher. I got to get saved. But here's the tragedy. Ain't nobody going to hell for five minutes and 13 seconds. Ain't nobody. You go to hell, it's over. You bust into hell, and the first thing going to hit your mind, I'm in hell, and I'm in hell forever. You're never coming out. There is no purgatory. There is no second chance. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Are you saved? What would five minutes and 13 seconds in hell do to your life? This message has been on my mind for three or four weeks. You can ask Brother back here in the deal. I, you know, I thought maybe he was going to preach it last week. thought maybe he was going to preach it week before. Never. Anyway, it's just been on my mind. I don't like to preach stuff like this. But it's got to be done. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Are you saved? If your heart quit beating right now, I heard Brother Larry Brown tell this story. In fact, he's the one who hooked me up with this video. Tell the story about the uh, Christian trucker. He was in a truck stop. He tried to witness to this trucker. He, he looked like he's kind of warped out on speed or something. He just wasn't acting right. He tried to witness to him. And the guy just mocked and scoffed him and then cussed Christian. He cussed him and I mean just let him have it. And that old trucker that loved the Lord and tried to witness to people, he left him alone finally. And that guy said, he, he said, he's going to get in his truck and leave. He said, you better watch out. said, I'll, I'll be coming down the road after you. And he said, sure enough. Not too many minutes later, he said, I'm going down the road with my truck. And he said, that truck comes just zooming by about 80 miles an hour. He said, he come by and he pulled his horn. He just went all crazy in that cab like that. And I'm going around you. And he said, it wasn't three miles down the road. He said, I mean... The explosion hit. He said, I got up here. He said his truck was off down over a ravine. Turned upside down. He said people were stopping, running down through there. And he said that gas was coming down. The fuel was coming down. Not gas, but diesel was coming down. And he said for some unknown reason, he said that truck burst into flames. And he said he's trapped. And he starts screaming. Get me out of here. Get me out of here. And they started pulling and they're trying to be trapped. They're calling everybody. They're calling the cops. They're calling that 911. They're calling, get down here, get down here, get down here. And that thing burst into flames. 
And they were trying to get him out, and he just started bursting flame. They couldn't. They had to back away. And they stood there 30, 40 feet away from him and listened to him scream to his death. And finally it went quiet. And one of the men stood there and said this. Well, at least his suffering's over. And that old Christian trucker turned around with tears in his eyes and said, no. It's just started. It's just started. Five minutes and 13 seconds in hell. I love you. I, w I want to preach things that encourage you. I want to preach things that will comfort you, that help you down the road of life. I need help. But on occasion, folks, we need to hear from God about fleeing from the wrath to come. Now, there's only two kinds of people in here. They're saved and unsaved. Ain't nobody in the middle of the road. Ain't nobody half saved and half lost. You're either saved or you're lost. You either have been born again in the Spirit of God or you're not. I'm not here to play games with you in just a few seconds. I'm going to have him put a song upon the wall. We're just going to sing together as a cappella as a congregation. And if you're not saved, here's what I'm telling you to do. You listen to me. Jesus Christ died for you on that cross. He is God's acceptable sacrifice. You can't die for you. You could die yourself. It wouldn't save you. Die for you. It wouldn't save you. Jesus died for you in your place. Shed his blood, the life, the flesh, and the blood. Shed his blood for your sins. Paid God's righteous punishment for your sins in his son's body and his son's blood. And Jesus Christ bear your sins in his body on the tree. And if this morning you will come to God and say, Lord, I may not understand everything, but I know I'm a lost sinner headed to hell. And I'm just asking you to save me for Jesus' sake. I'm telling you, it's not by feelings. You may cry and you may not. I don't know. But I know with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And I know this. Watch this. No, whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. You get up to come to get saved this morning, God's not going to say, no, not you. You sin too much. No. You ain't sin too much. Jesus' blood cleanses from all sin. Satan will drag you through all kinds of... Right now, while I'm getting ready to give invitation, Satan's going to lie to you and tell you 42 different things why you shouldn't get saved this morning. He's going to tell you every stinking lie out of the bowels of hell. He'll throw them at you just like that. I mean, he'll lie to you. He'll say, well, some people think I'm already saved. My kids think I'm saved. My mom and daddy think I'm saved. And he's going to lie to you so fast, make your head swim. I'm asking you today to come, not to me. I'm not asking you to join our church. I'm asking you to come to the cross of Calvary. I'm asking you to come to Jesus Christ. He is the Savior of the world. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by him. You either have Jesus Christ as your Savior. You may have religion, but do you have Jesus Christ? Would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, as best I know, God, I preach what you had me to preach. <laughs> now I'm asking you, Lord, don't let my personality or anything... <laughs> And even my wickedness get in the way of people being saved today. I ask you, Father, cleanse me, wash me, help me not to be in the way of nobody. And I'm asking you, God, for liberty and freedom that folks would throw off the lies of the devil and his excuses and his putting off things. And I'm asking God today that you'd help people to be honest with themselves and not care what anybody else thinks. And I'm praying, God, today that you reward the sufferings of your Son with the conversion and the salvation, repentance, and faith in Christ. God, do only what you can do at this point. Convict and draw. And I pray, oh God, that they may see an empty cross and an empty tomb and a risen Savior seated at the right hand of the Father, waiting on them to come to the throne of mercy and grace right now. You're here in this building today, only you and God. But if the Holy Ghost of God has pricked your heart, something inside says this is about you, you know it is, you know it is, you know it is. If I were you, I wouldn't hesitate. I'd, immediately as we stand up, I'd come somewhere and find a place to kneel down and pray and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, your son. And at that moment, dear friend, God will make a new man with you and birth a new creature in Jesus Christ. God, don't lie to nobody. He will do what he said. He said, oh, watch this. He said, he's able to save to the uttermost. You say, well, I need to do some changing. Oh, you let him save you, then let God do the changing. Let's stand together. You come this morning as the song is on the wall. Can you put that song on the wall there? Father in heaven, I pray now, God, that you'll draw by your spirit. Would you come today without any song and dance, without any, anything? You just, you just lost. You need the Lord. Would you come? Some of you today, you're saved, but you've not warned the lost. You're not, you haven't warned the wicked to flee from his way, and you've gotten cold and backslid, and you're just kind of like you don't care about souls no more, and you want to come, let God. But I want us to sing today this. Let's congregation sing and you come. And if you're listening online, please listen to me. You may be in your house. I don't know where you're at. But God will save you anywhere. God will save you anywhere. If you call upon him. Call upon the name of the Lord. And he'll save you. As I went down to the river to pray. Study in the dark that good old way and good shall wear. The sorry crown. Are you saved? Would you come? Would you come to Christ today? Would you come to the Lord Jesus Christ today? Won't you bow your heads with me? Let me ask you a question. If right now God would say it's your time, it's your time. It's your time. How many know based upon the Word of God, not how you feel, but based upon the Word of God that you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you know you're saved, and you know that according to the Word of God, you'd be at the Lord. Would you slip your hand up high? And would you worship Him right now and thank Him that I'm not going to hell? Amen. Put them down. A lot of people here, and I don't try to hunt out people that didn't have their hands raised. But if you were here and you couldn't raise that hand, I want to ask you this. Would you at least let me pray for you today? I'm not going to be coming back to you. I'm not going to be stopping you at the door. And I probably ought to. Probably ought to, but I'm not. I just want to know how to pray for because I know it takes God to save you. Would you say, Pastor, preacher, pray for me. I couldn't raise my hand. My soul is troubled. I'm afraid if I died in the condition I'm in, I'd bust hell wide open. Would you slip your hand up high where I can see it and I'll know how to pray for you? High anywhere in this building. I'm lost without God. Will you spurn the love of the Lord? Will you spurn the love of a dying Savior? Is there a hand in this building anywhere? Anywhere. I don't lie about imitations. I don't see a hand raised in this building, and that's okay. I hope, everybody here, I hope everybody's saved. If you are, go talk to others about their soul. Do something to warn the wicked of their, of their danger. Heavenly Father, I ask now, God, that you would take this message and use it however you see fit and cause people to hear it and to listen to it that might need to be saved. I pray, God, that this church will keep its priorities right, and I pray that we'll stay in balance and that we'll realize, Lord, why Jesus died. It wasn't just to give us a nice life. It wasn't so that we could have good health here. It wasn't so that we could have, make money here. He died to save us from the wrath to come. Help us ever be mindful of that. And God, help us to ever be grateful for the redeeming blood. But the truth about it is, Lord, and you know this is the truth, that I myself would be in hell today had it not been for the intervention of God Almighty through Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Lord, I thank you that you loved me while I was yet a sinner and that Christ died for me. God, make the gospel clear to people today that salvation is a gift. They can't work for it. They can't change and do better to get saved. They need Christ. They need Christ. Help them, God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight. I'll be talking a little bit tonight about the uh, project about the elderly.